Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Grant Application Cycle Webinar uh, for the Land and Water Conservation Fund Grant Program. My name is Naomi Enciso. I am the grant coordinator and will be talking your ear off this morning for about two hours. Uh, so this is me and this is my direct contact information. Um, I'll present this information again at the end of the um, slides just in case you maybe missed it this morning. Today we're going to go over three main topics. The first being the general program information. So we'll talk about what the program is, eligibility requirements, and the general application requirements. Then we'll get into specifics for this grant cycle. So uh, scheduling, grant funding available, av availability, uh, what the competition process looks like, scoring criteria, and uh, just some tips for you as new applicants or returning applicants. And then we'll also talk about responsibilities uh, as an applicant and then if you've been awarded a grant uh, as a grantee. And then of course, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. If you do have questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and use the Q&A box. We do have Jody and Michelle monitoring those as they come in. Okay, so getting right into the grant uh, program history. So the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act was passed in the 60s and provides funding assistance for public outdoor recreation. Funding for this program comes from outer continental shelf revenues derived from leasing of oil and gas sites in coastal waters. A portion of it also comes from sales of federal surplus real property, a portion of federal motorboat fuel taxes, fees for recreation use of federal lands, and Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act uh, revenues. The fund is based on the concept of we're using revenues from the depletion of one resource, offshore oil and gas, and using that revenue to conserve parks, wildlife refuges, forests, open spaces, trails, and wildlife habitat. So the Land and Water Conservation Fund Program, one of the important things to know um, if you are applying for or accepting grant funds from this program is that by doing so, you are committing the entire park or recreation area for public outdoor recreation use in perpetuity. And that is not limited to just the space that has received the funding assistance, the land and water encumbrance applies to the park as a whole. And we'll talk a lot more about that later in today's presentation. If you only take one thing away from today's webinar, it really should be this conversion policy. The Land and Water Conservation Fund acts requires that all property acquired or developed with land and, land and water conservation fund funding remains exclusively for public outdoor recreation use in perpetuity. No property can be wholly or partly converted to an unallowable use without the approval of the Secretary of the Interior. Parks or recreation areas acquired or developed with LWCF assistance are referred to as LWCF assisted areas and or LWCF boundary areas. And they, again, we'll talk a little bit more about the conversion policy and the in perpetuity requirement um, later in today's presentation. The LWCF is divided into two programs. There's the state side, which provides matching grants to states and through states to local units of government. This is the program that we administer at the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. In addition to helping fund outdoor recreation areas and facilities, the LWCF also funds development of the Statewide Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan, or SCORP. The other side of LWCF is the federal side, which is used to acquire lands, waters, and interests therein necessary 
to achieve the natural, cultural, wildlife, and recreation management objectives of federal land management agencies. This is a pass-through grant program. Uh, and again, today, because we do administer the state side, that is what we'll be uh, focusing on in today's presentation. So with this pass-through grant program, the applicant submits their application to the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. After the review and selection process, OPRD will work to secure the funds from the National Park Service for projects that are recommended for funding. National Park Service grants the funds to the state through a federal and state agreement. Oregon Parks and Recreation Department will then pass through those funds to the grantee by way of a state and local grant agreement. The state liaison officer is designated by the governor and has authority to accept and administer funds for the purposes of LWCF program and to perform the other functions set forth in the federal LWCF manual. In Oregon, the state liaison officer is Lisa Sumption, our Oregon Parks and Recreation Director. Authority to provide financial assistance to states for outdoor recreation purposes has been delegated by the Department of the Interior to the National Park Service. All LWCF matters, concerns, or questions from applicants and grantees must come through the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department first. We partner with applicants to prepare the project application for the National Park Service. We work through the project reporting and reimbursements with you, and we'll work on all post-award compliance issues, and of course, help to answer questions or concerns. So let's get into eligibility. Eligible project sponsors, um, this refers to those who can apply to the LWCF program. So this includes cities, counties, park and recreation districts, metro, port districts, and federally recognized mm -hmm. Indian tribes. Per the Oregon Administrative Rule, Chapter 736, um, not less than 60% of our LWCF funds can be allocated to these entities and up to 40% of the remainder of the funding can be allocated to eligible state agency projects from the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Oregon Department of State Lands. Eligible project types. We offer four types of applications, acquisition, development, rehabilitation, and what we call a combination, which combines the acquisition of real property with, with either development or restoration work. Pictures shown on this slide and most of these slides to come are pictures of projects that have actually received land and water funding. And the last part of eligibility would be the ownership and control of the property. The proposed facility must be under the control and tenure of the public agency that sponsors the grant. This can be by fee simple title, or in some instances can be by lesser rights, such as permanent easements that provide permanent control of the property commensurate with the proposed development. Lesser rights must ensure the desired public use without diminishing the control and tenure of the property sponsor's ability to enforce the provisions of the LWCF Act. No approval will be given for the development of facilities on leased land, with the exception of the last two bullets on the screen, uh, one being the property is leased from federal government with no less than 25 years remaining on the lease and is not revocable at will, or the property is leased from one public agency to another for 25 years or more, and there must be safeguards to ensure the perpetual use requirement. Additionally, this will require joint sponsorship of the proposed project, meaning you both will have to sign the grant agreement, and a written agreement stipulating the lesser land owning agency will assume compliance responsibility for the LWCF boundary in the event of default or expiration of the lease. 
Okay, so let's talk about acquisitions. Acquisitions may be accomplished through purchase, transfer, or by donation. Acquisitions can be for a completely new recreation area or to add on to an already existing public outdoor recreation facility. As with all projects that receive a LWCF grant, the project must be dedicated and open for general public outdoor recreation use. There can be modest structures on the site, but they must be open for or in support of public outdoor recreation. Your application must list all of the structures and describe their intended use for outdoor recreation or disposition. And uh, actually, I just remembered before I move on, this web webinar is being recorded and will be provided. Um, it'll, it'll be made available shortly after today. So, you know, don't worry about writing a ton of notes. The slides will be available for you. Um, there will also be chapters on the recording so that if you want to go back and listen to a specific section, you don't have to re-listen to me for an hour and a half. You can go directly to that part of the presentation. Okay, let's see here. LWCF may be used to acquire a structure only if it will be used to support or is necessary to achieve the outdoor recreation goal for the site. For instance, a garage or storage building that can be converted to an operation and maintenance shed. We'll of course want to coordinate early with the National Park Service regarding the eligibility of a structure. LWCF funds can only be used for the land acquisition itself. The LWCF Act precludes assistance for its incidental costs relating to acquisition. So things like appraisals are not something that we can help pay for. With the program, you can also acquire the property and develop it later. This is called acquisition for delayed development. Development should take place within three years from when you take ownership of the property. In the interim, the property should be open for public recreation purposes that the land is capable of supporting without the development. For instance, social trails and wildlife viewing. Uh, the property cannot be gated or closed in the interim. These are some examples of ineligible acquisitions. You can, of course, refer to the state program manual and the federal land and water manual for more information, or you can get a hold of me if you have specific questions about your project. These are more examples of ineligible acquisitions. The Uniform Act provides important protections and equitable treatment of persons displaced from their homes, businesses, or farms by federal and federally assisted programs and establishes uniform and equitable land acquisition policies for the federally assisted programs, such as the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Note, the acquisition itself does not need to be federally funded for the rules to apply. If LWCF funds are used in any phase of the project, such as subsequent LWCF assisted development, the Uniform Act may apply. There are specific timeframes described in the federal manual of when this would be the case. If you think this may apply to your project or if you have further questions, please contact me. If you acquire property and plan to demolish a residence on that property, there may be additional steps required of you, including compliance with the Uniform Act. All acquisition grants require an appraisal and an appraisal review, also known as a desk review, by a, certified, by a state certified appraiser and must be to Yellow Book standards. It is recommended that if you have not yet received an appraisal and you are going to order one, that you let the appraiser know you'll need an appraisal review. They likely uh, will want to coordinate those at the same time. Appraisals and desk appraisals must be done by the time the application is submitted to Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. The appraised value will guide the total project cost and the grant amount. 
only the fair market value is eligible for LWCF assistance. Initiating the appraisal and the appraisal review are the responsibility of the applicant. If you already have a yellow book appraisal that was completed in the last 12 months, but you have not done the appraisal review yet, please get a hold of me. You may be able to submit your application with just the appraisal for now and then get the appraisal review after you know if your project has been recommended for funding. An appraisal is not required if the project sponsor determines that the valuation problem is uncomplicated and that the anticipated value of the real property is less than $25,000. In this case, a waiver valuation will be prepared instead of an appraisal, provided the owner has been offered the option to have an appraisal and they've elected to have the acquiring agency prepare a waiver valuation instead. The waiver valuation should be prepared by a knowledgeable person who is aware of the general market values in the project area. The person preparing the valuation is not intended to be an appraiser, but they must have sufficient understanding of the local real estate market to be qualified and shall not have any interest, direct or indirect, in the real property being valued for compensation. Uh, pretty important here, do not acquire the property before you've received the federal award. That I cannot stress enough. Uh, doing so will deem your application ineligible unless you've been granted a waiver of retroactivity. A waiver of retroactivity gives advanced approval to close on a property without a grant agreement. This is done if there is a necessity to immediately acquire the land prior to being awarded, such as the property is being offered for sale and the local government may lose out on the chance to buy it if they don't act now, resulting in a loss of significant opportunity. A waiver means the retroactive cost may be eligible for LWCF assistance if the agreement is later approved. A waiver is only an acknowledgement of the need for immediate action it does not imply nor assure approval of the project. The retroactive costs are incurred at the risk of the applicants. If you take ownership before the grant and you don't have a waiver of retroactivity, then your application will be deemed ineligible. If you think you may need a waiver of retroactivity, please contact me as soon as possible and we can work through that process. Um, and then just some final notes on acquisition projects. Please submit all documents digitally via the grant system. And actually that applies to all of our applications. Acquisition applications will generally not be reviewed if there is no appraisal or appraisal review unless you have made prior arrangements with me before submitting. Summarized information on acquisitions can be found in the Oregon State LWCF Program Manual um, which is currently under development and will be made available prior to the go live date of September 1st. Okay, moving on to development and rehabilitation projects. The application for both of these project types is identical and uses the same scoring criteria. If your project consists of some development and some rehabilitation, you can use your judgment to select the application category. If the project has more rehabilitation or restoration, go ahead and use the rehab application. If there is more new development than there is rehabilitation, then you can go ahead and use the development application. Development projects create new outdoor recreation facilities in accordance with the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan, or SCORP, recreation elements of a local comprehensive plan, master plan, or other planning efforts. As part of project readiness, we want to see most of the front end work complete by the, by the time you're submitting the application and the project as close to shovel ready as possible. And although we do allow items uh, such as final design and engineering, plans and specifications and permits in the budget, those types of costs are limited to 15% of the total project budget. 
uh, you may be approved to incur these types of costs before the grant and still include them in the budget, um, you'll just need to identify them as pre-award. And I'll show you an example of that um, when we get to the budget part of the of today's presentation. This is a list of possible eligible projects. Uh, the list is vast and the list here is not all inclusive. Generally, if your project is for the purpose of public outdoor recreation and you are an eligible applicant and you can satisfy all of the other eligibility requirements, including having control and tenure of the property, then your project is likely eligible. So talk to me if you do have a unique situation or question. We oftentimes see projects a, a lot of times involving ball fields, outdoor sports courts, playgrounds, and restrooms. Those are probably our more common project types we see. A development project may consist of one improvement or a group of related improvements designed to provide basic facility uh, needs for outdoor recreation, including facilities for access, safety, security, health, and protection of the area. As far as support facilities, we don't typically pay for indoor structures unless it is a support facility for outdoor recreation, such as restrooms or a facility to store outdoor recreation maintenance equipment. Access roads to a designated park and recreation area that are not a part of the state, county, or local road system extending beyond or through the boundaries of the area may be eligible. Other eligible support facilities include parking, landscaping, and pathways. There is an exception to the outdoor recreation requirement and that is called the cold climatic criteria. Um, so that would allow a sheltered ice skating rink um, to be submitted as a project. If it's located in a community where the mean annual total snowfall is at least 24 inches, or the normal daily mean temperature for the coldest winter month is 30 degrees or less. The program may also allow sheltered swimming pools if it's in a community where the normal daily mean temperature for the month of June is 72 degrees or less. And the federal manual requests that you gather this information from the comparative climatic data for the US published by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Okay, so this is a list of ineligible projects. Um, again, it's indoor facilities. Anything that is routine maintenance and repair uh, would not be eligible. That's a bit different from restoration and rehabilitation. Uh, professional facilities are not eligible. Exhibit areas for non-recreational purposes historic sites, museums, historic structures. Um, so if you have specific questions, again, contact me and we can talk through it. This list is an example of ineligible support facilities or portions of support facilities which contribute primarily to public indoor activities. So auditoriums, libraries, motels, Okay, and major rehabilitation. For this, we see uh, this is for projects in, that involve the restoration or partial reconstruction of eligible recreation areas and facilities, which is necessitated by one or more of the circumstances shown on the screen. Changing recreational needs, the last bullet point on the slide here, would be if, for instance, you went through a master planning update and discovered the community wasn't using the existing facility and they want something else instead. That would be considered a major rehabilitation project for which you can submit a grant application. And again, rehabilitation is not the same as routine maintenance and repairs that should be kept up with regularly, such as cleaning, painting, and minor repairs. Okay, so moving on to boundary maps and site plans, both of which are required attachments in your application. 
The LWCF boundary maps are used to confirm boundary encumbrance with all parties. They're used to compare to past projects if applicable. They identify potential future conversions and hopefully avoid them. And they identify easements, leases, lesser property interests. This is one of the most important elements of your application. This map becomes a permanent record of the boundary that you are committing in perpetuity for public outdoor recreation use. Consistent with the intent of the LWCF Act, the program expectation is that the entirety, the entirety of the park or recreation area being acquired, developed, or expanded will be included within the LWCF boundary. In short, the whole park or recreation area must be put into the LWCF boundary. If any part of the LWCF boundary is converted out of public for outdoor recreation use, then it triggers what we call a conversion. Conversions can happen when the property interests are conveyed for private use or non-public outdoor recreation uses, either private or public. Unallowable indoor facilities are developed within the boundary without the National Park Service approval, such as unauthorized public facilities and sheltering of, outdoor, of an outdoor facility, or a conversion can be caused by a termination of public use. Additionally, arrangements that require granting property rights, such as an easement, will also constitute a conversion. The conversion provisions of the LWCF Act apply to each area or facility for which LWCF assistance is obtained, regardless of the extent of partic participation in the program. So if your park has received, for instance, um, a Land and Water Conservation Fund Act several decades ago to rehabilitate uh, you know, a restroom building on the site, chances are very likely that the entire park is encumbered to LWCF, and you'll need to be cautious if you've considered, considered an activity that may trigger a conversion. And you may be asking yourself, can I just pay back the grant amount to resolve the conversion? And the answer to that is no, no, you cannot. The only way to remedy a conversion is to purchase and develop replacement property. And there's a lot more criteria that needs to be checked off and many steps in this process. If you've ever gone through a conversion, you know it's lengthy, it's expensive, and at times it can be frustrating. Okay, so uh, exceptions for boundaries for a lesser unit may be considered only when it can be shown that the area is self-supporting without reliance upon adjoining or additional areas not identified in the scope of the project, such as for access, utilities, park support facilities, and et cetera. These requests are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis by the National Park Service LWCF Washington office prior to award of a grant. In an LWCF boundary map, uh, these are the things that are required. Um, and we've recently come up with a checklist that I can provide after today's presentation to aid you and your development of the boundary map. Um, this information is also available on our Oregon State Program Manual, as well as the Federal Manual in Chapter 6. Uh, this is a list of things that are not necessarily required in a boundary map, but they certainly are helpful if you can include them. And I'll show you a couple of examples here in the next slides. Okay, so uh, this is one example of what a boundary map might look like. Um, you can see here, this is the checklist of required items. Um, this is not checked off because there were no leases in the area, so it did not apply. But you can see here in this example that they've also included a couple of the things that were not required, but not required, but it's certainly helpful. So we can see there's a, a legend, there's a map scale, there's additional information. Um, this was the first land and water boundary or uh, grant at this park. And so there are no prior 
grant numbers here, but if there were, um, hopefully we would see a list of what those were. Okay, here's another example of what a boundary map could look like. This one's a little bit um, unique in the sense that when the project was submitted, when the grant application was submitted to us in 2018, this park was about this size. And upon closing up the grant, they had actually uh, expanded the park facility area. And so um, when we ended up closing the grant, the boundary was larger than what we started with, which is, which is completely fine. And again, if, you know, it's the um, expectation of the program that the entirety of the park be encumbered. And so we could not have done a final boundary map looking this way if the park had actually expanded um, by the time we closed out the grant. Okay, and here's another example. Um, this is a good map. We can clearly see the boundary with the red outline here. We can see there's easements that they've pointed out. Um, we can see the acreage and all of those other things that were required. Um, sometimes there are compatible indoor facilities there. I think there was one over here. Um, make sure to identify those on the map so that there are no surprises later down the road. Um, this way it shows that the facilities predate the land and water grant and were not added after the fact. So then a lot of research is required to determine if a conversion was or was not triggered. Okay, and in this fourth example, um, sometimes the applicant may not have the um, ability to submit a boundary map, um, you know, with aerial view and all of these other great things. So that's where our GIS staff here at Oregon Parks and Recreation Department can help. Um, this is an example of a map created by our OPRD GIS staff. Um, they usually have to map your boundaries when we close out a grant to include them on our interactive map that I'll show you later in today's presentation. And so sometimes it is easier for them if they create the map to begin with, but we do still ask for your draft map up front so that they have something to work off of if they are going to help with creating your boundary map for the National Park Service. <clears throat> if the map that you submit satisfied us all of the requirements, we just may use that map. Um, if it needs a little bit of help, then that's where I may be asking our GIS folks to help um, create the map and then, of course, run it by you before turning it over to the National Park Service. Okay, so this is a list of things that are helpful to include on a site plan, um, but not required. So in some instances, the site plan can be the boundary map, depending on the project. If combining the two, you know, the site plan and the boundary map starts to get a little bit busy on the map and uh, where it makes it difficult to read, then it may be best in that case to separate the two. The site development plan that gets submitted with the grant application is used for understanding the proposed scope of work. It's used for tribal consultation where it can outline the area of potential effect for interested tribes. And it's also used for compliance. So NPS looks at your site plan to see if there's any potential threatened and endangered species impacts, if there's any potential wetland impacts, if there are potential floodplain development impacts, and if there's any potential Natural Historic Preservation Act impacts. This is an example of a site plan that we've previously received. Um, this is a good one because it identifies existing elements in the park. Um, so they've labeled existing park restroom, for instance. And it also labels the proposed renovations or additions. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but um, they've, they've labeled those. And then it shows the project area where it's situated within the entirety of the park. And we don't need necessarily a professional rendering for the site plan. 
it can even be a picture, um, you know, from Google where you've hand drawn the elements so long as it's elig legible and easy to identify. Okay, so what we're seeing here is um, on the left is an example of a grant application site plan. So you can see they've labeled their proposed elements, proposed single stall restroom, and they've also um, outlined where their boundary is, as well as the existing facilities, so existing shelter. Upon grant closeout, we do request a completed or as-built site plan. So um, you can see over here, the items that were proposed are now existing. So they've identified those. This makes it easy for us and the National Park Service to, to identify the project elements that were proposed and determine whether they were completed or if there was some change that we need to talk about. Okay, environmental review. The environmental review of the Land and Water Conservation Fund applications require a couple of different steps. So the first being um, in the application packet, you'll find an application and revision form, also referred to as the A and R form. This is the narrative portion of the federal application. And so you may find that some of the questions in that form may seem redundant or similar to the online application that you're completing for us. Um, so please do copy and paste wherever you can. We do need the two because they serve different purposes. The ANR form includes the environmental resources survey, which helps, um, which helps us and the National Park Service determine what the proposed NEPA pathway should be. You'll also please want to use the transmittal form and memos that we provide to you in the LWCF packet. If you've ever applied to our other recreation grant programs, you might recall that those programs require a similar environmental review. Please do use what we've provided in this form, um, in this packet, because our program, the LWCF, does not have the same requirements as our other grant programs. Um, we use a different environmental resources survey that gets provided by the National Park Service. We have a different um, state agency review form that indicates this project is being reviewed for federal grant assistance. And for our application, you'll want to consult with the Department of State Land Department of Environmental Quality and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, to see if they have any comments on your project and any potential impacts. You may also need to contact other agencies depending on your project. If the reviewing agency needs additional information, you will need to follow up with them to address their comments to you. You don't need to send in your application the back and forth between you and that agency just the final comments. And if you don't receive a response from the reviewing agency, please upload a copy of your consultation email to that agency with your application. So again, these top three here in the bullet points, these are the agencies that you'll definitely need to reach out to for comments. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office, I will contact on your behalf. And again, depending on your project and uh, the scope, you may need to contact additional agencies. Um, in the packet, I will provide to you a contact list. It's uh, being updated now, but th that should be made available on our website shortly, as well as in the online application. Okay. And you must give the reviewing agency at least 30 days to comment. We highly recommend that you start the environmental review immediately as, as you will need to include that with your application. And it is okay if you don't receive a response back by the application due date. In that case, you'll just upload a copy of the email that you sent to the agency or agencies requesting comment. Please do not pressure the agencies to provide a response sooner than 30 days. They, 
they do have at least 30 days to review. Okay, so when you're soliciting comments from the natural, um, from the state natural resource agencies, one of the um, things that you'll need to supply to them is the A and R form, which can be mostly complete when you solicit comments. Um, for that form, again, it's the federal portion of the it's the narrative portion of the federal application. So uh, for the environmental review purposes, you'll probably just want to focus on the description of the project, which is on page one, and on the environmental section, which is section 3.0 of the form. Comments that you receive back from these agencies can serve in helping you complete the environmental portion of the ANR form, which again will inform OPRD and the National Park Service of the recommended NEPA pathway. Comments can also inform you of permits that may be required, inform you if your project may have adverse effects to a natural resource um, and, and other important things. Okay, and then uh, just a note for you on the ANR form in general is that again, this is a federal document and it is used for uh, amendments and new applications. Um, as well as different project types. So you'll, you'll find that not all of the sections will apply to your project. Um, and before go live of this, up, of this new grant cycle, I'm going to put some annotations into the ANR form to hopefully guide you a little bit more as you're completing that form. This is what section 3.C of that ANR form looks like. This is the environmental resources survey portion of the, of the form. Um, you'll notice here that it has three columns and it does not have a does not apply column. So if, there, if there's a resource listed, for instance, you know, um, coastal barrier resources or coastal zones, if that does not exist for your project, rather than leaving the checklist blank for that row, I recommend that you type in does not exist or resource, you know, res does not apply, um, just so that we know that it has not been overlooked and it just does not exist. So there is no impact. Okay, so still part of that same section in the ANR form, there's a separate table, table two, um, which asks for impacts on other um, resources. And again, there's no does not apply column. Please pay close mind to the selections made on this particular table. If you answer yes or a question mark, an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement may be required. Okay, and then this is these questions are below the table two in the form. You can expand on any selections made in the tables in, in these questions here, especially if you've indicated that there will be a negative or an unknown impact to a resource. The environmental resources survey should be completed with professional input from resource experts and in consultation with relevant local, state, tribal and federal governments as appropriate. You'll need to identify all who contributed to filling out the environmental resource survey, including name, title, agency, and qualifications they possess that provide the necessary resource expertise to determine impact significance. So that's your question number four. Um, and again, this form helps to support a chosen NEPA pathway and must be completed before final action can be taken by the National Park Service. The Environmental Resource Survey helps administer administratively document a categorical exclusion recommendation or the necessity of further environmental review through an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. The Environmental Resources Survey can also be used to document previously conducted yet still valid environmental analysis. And most of the time we do find that projects are categorically excluded. Build America by America. 
Built America by America Act was passed in November 2021 and went into effect in May of 2022. All of the iron, steel, manufactured products, and construction materials used in the project are to be produced in the United States unless subject to an approved waiver. All agreements and any amendments moving forward will include this language. And here is what is and what is not included in the meaning of construction materials. Um, so this again will be provided to you after, so you don't need to take a lot of notes here. Um, this is also a new, um, new language in our agreement for the convention. We do recommend that you research product availability and costs as part of your process. Do plan on requesting heat mill certificates if applicable from vendors or their manufacturers. This act covers everything in the project, including items paid for with matching funds or donations. Waivers may be possible. For more information on this topic and more, um, you can click on the links in the next slide. Please note that the information we've received from our federal partners is quite limited at this time. And so for now, this is the type of supporting documentation we're requesting to show compliance until further guidance is received from the National Park Service. There were two uh, waivers that were recently approved or earlier in this year. The small grants waiver applies uh, for projects $250,000 or less. And this is total project cost, so not just the federal portion of the project. And there's also the de minimis waiver, which uh, waives Build America by America Act requirements for up to 5% of the total project costs, up to a maximum of 1 million. And both of these waivers are currently in effect through May 20th of 2028. Okay, so getting into the specifics of this grant application. Um, so this is our deadline that we're working with this year, pretty similar if you uh, applied last year. So it's pretty similar to that, that last grant cycle. Applications will become available online on September 1st through your oprdgrants.org account. Application deadline will be November 1st. Uh, followed by the Grant Advisory Committee meeting, which they will meet sometime um, spring of 2024. Our Oregon State Parks and Recreation Commission will take the recommendations from the committee and uh, vote on those April of 2024. Applications will be submitted to the National Park Service in their next available federal funding opportunity round. So they offer in a year, uh, I think it's three different windows when states can submit final applications. And in order for an application to be considered final, NPS will need to have completed all federal compliance processes, including NEPA and 106. Okay, so in this grant cycle, we will have approximately $4 million available to award. Uh, that may be subject to change depending on carryover from prior cycles. So we may have a little bit more, um, but as for now, we have about $4 million. And again, not less than 60% can be allocated to local government and federally recognized Indian tribes, and up to 40% can be allocated for eligible state agency projects. It is not recommended that you apply for a small LWCF grant due to the perpetual requirements and the extensive amount of work required, unless the project is for a location that already has an existing LWCF boundary. If you need a small grant, you may want to consider our local government grant program. That program begins accepting applications around the first of the year and it runs on an annual grant cycle. LGGP, Local Government Grant Program, is our lottery-funded grant program that was designed to look like LWCF with some exceptions, the biggest being that it does not have the perpetual requirements. 
For more information, visit the OPRD website and select LGGP. Okay, so here's a look at our last couple of grant cycles just to give you an idea of the level of competition. Historically, we've been able to recommend over half of the applications that we've received each cycle. The top of the blue bar indicates the number of applications received, and the top of the green bar indicates the number of projects that were recommended for funding. So for instance, in 2014, we received 20 applications, and of those, 12 were recommended for funding. In 2022, in last year's grant cycle, we received 10 applications and all 10 were recommended for funding. And then you'll also uh, notice starting in 2020, we moved into an annual grant cycle. Project budget. In recent years, the National Park Service has requested more detailed budgets. We want a detailed budget, but not overly detailed, if that makes any sense. So we don't need to know the cost of every nut and bolt, just the major elements of the project. So on screen, this is an example of what an acceptable uh, project budget might look like. Expenses paid for outside of the grant or match should not be included in the budget. We need tangible budget items, meaning Contingency line items are not allowed in the budget. If you have a 10% contingency, for instance, you can spread that over the cost of your um, tangible project elements. Time spent preparing the grant application, completing progress reports, or reimbursement requests are not eligible as match or for reimbursement, as these activities are not directly attributed to the project implementation. And again, please be sure to identify pre-award costs. You'll see here in this example, pre-award was um, typed into the budget in parentheses. And uh, on the ANR form, it actually asks for pre-agreement expenses there as well. So make sure to pay close attention to that. Okay, and this is where we often see a lot of errors in the application. Um, I do recommend revisiting this portion of the presentation if you need to, or you can refer to the online grant application, or you can also give me a call and I can walk you through it. So, so to add a budget item in your application, um, this is what it's going to eventually look like. Um, you'll first want to click Add Worksheet Item. So again, this is in your um, OPRD Grantstar.org account once you've accessed your online application. So you'll click Add Worksheet Item. You'll enter the description of what that item is. So in this example, we're entering General Site Improvements, Installing Site Furnishings. You'll enter the full amount of what that project item costs. Leave this box, box unchecked in this first step. What we're doing is we're just adding in the um, project item and the full cost. So we're not addressing match at this point yet. And then you'll click add item. Okay, so um, once you've entered in all of your project items, that now you're going to go back in and start adding the match. So in this example, we're adding match that is not coming from another grant. To do that, you'll again go back into add worksheet item. You'll describe the type of match. In this case, we're using cash, cash match. In this line, uh, you're gonna leave that at zero. So this is where you'll check the box. Yes, now we're addressing match. So do check, does this item include match? And this is where you're going to enter your match amount. So in this example, it is $600,000 cash that we're providing as match from agency budgeted funds. You'll click add item and repeat 
repeat that step if you have multiple match sources that are not coming from a grant. Um, so you'll want to do that, you know, for the two or three or how many ever match sources you have. If your match is coming from another grant, the, the steps for that, it's pretty similar um, with the exception of one additional checkbox. So you'll click add worksheet item. You'll describe the grant. So this is the Recreational Trails Program grant. Again, you'll leave this zero when, you, when you're adding your match. You'll select the Does This Item Include Match checkbox. And this is where you're, where you're going to enter the match amount. So in this example, we're entering $55,200 from the Recreational Trails Program grant. Source of funding is the local government grant program. You're going to check the box here because it does come from another grant. And this is where you'll give a little bit more information on the grant. So uh, if it's federal um, for this program, and we'll talk about it in a little bit here, there are no other federal um, match sources that can be used as grant match for this for this program, except for if it's a recreational trails program grant or a grant from the community development block grant program. Okay, so I've provided more information on my RTP grant. I have clicked add item and you'll repeat that if you have multiple grants that you're using as match. And so once you're done, this is what your project budget will look like in the online system. So this top portion will be auto filled by the system depending on what you've entered. This is a 50 50 grant. So we can see here the split. Uh, by entering the information um, as described in step one, you can see all of the project elements are here with their, with their full costs. And by entering the match separately, now we've identified those down here. So what we don't want to see is the project elements both here and here. So we want to see project elements in the project budget worksheet, and we want to see only the sources of match in this section down here. Uh, I think I might stop there just because this is usually, again, one of the places where we see a lot of mistakes. Um, so I can take questions or if you want to save those for the end, we can do that as well. Okay, no questions. Okay, match requirements. Um, in these next few slides, we'll talk about match. Again, this is a 50-50 grant match program. Having additional match beyond 50% minimum does not necessarily give you more points. If you are going to use another grant as match and it has not yet been awarded, please make sure that you address that in your application um, and talk about what your plan B is in the event that you are not successful receiving that grant. Also address the timing of the other grant. So when is the award expected to become available? All match sources need to be secured by the time we submit the final application to the National Park Service. Again, as a reminder, no other federal sources of match are allowable except for the Recreational Trails Program and the Community Development Block Grant Program. Funds from the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, as, are not allowed as match. Everything that you use as match has to be an, elig an eligible item. Um, so we talked about the 15% a little bit earlier in the, in the presentation. So professional costs are considered those costs that are not directly on the ground, such as planning and engineering. Those types of costs are allowable, but they are limited to 15% of the total project cost. And you can incur those costs before the agreement is awarded, 
Um, just make sure that you're identifying those as pre-award in the budget and that they've been incurred only within three years before. Okay, so uh, volunteer labor is also an acceptable use as, as of match. It must be documented with a volunteer labor timesheet when the time comes that you're using the volunteer labor. It is our preference that you use volunteer or donated labor rates that are consistent with regular rates you typically pay general laborers for similar work in your city, district, or county. The time of a person donating services will be valued at the rate paid as a general laborer unless the, per unless the person is professionally skilled in the work being performed on the project, such as a plumber or a mason. In that case, use the wage rate this individual is normally paid for performing the service. The rates for labor are the bare rates. No payroll additives or overhead costs may be included since the sponsor is paying none. If you don't have guidance for rates consistent with that activity, you can use fully rates. You can also use donated materials or donated equipment as part of your match. Prices, including, prices included in the matching share should be reasonable, fair market value or fair rental value. If you have a schedule with your agency, you can use that. If you don't have a schedule, you can ask a local rental agency in your area for a rental schedule and see what the equipment would typically rent for per hour. You may also use donated property. Any application that includes the value of property should be submitted as an acquisition or as a combination application and you would follow the same steps as you would with an acquisition um, with using a yellow book appraisal, having a desk appraisal, and you must take ownership within the grant period, not before the grant is awarded. Okay, so in this section, we'll talk about the competition, uh, the types of questions that you'll see in the application and the criteria. The open project selection process provides objective criteria and standards for grant selection that are explicitly based on the state's priority needs for the acquisition and development of outdoor recreation resources as identified in the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan or SCORP. The, the OPSP or the or uh, sorry, the open project selection process is the connection between the SCORP and the use of LWCF grants to assist state efforts in meeting high priority outdoor recreation resource needs. In this grant cycle, we are still using our 2019 to 2023 SCORP. Um, the next SCORP is currently under development. This is what the LWCF scoring criteria is this year. Um, it remains the same as it has, I think in the last one to two years. Um, we did add two new criteria, I think two grant cycles ago. Uh, we added the diversity, equity, and inclusion criteria, as well as the sustainability criteria. Most of the points do come from the SCORP specific sections. 70 points are possible uh, from the SCORP criteria. And a couple of grant cycles, we also increased the discretionary committee criteria points um, by five. So committee bases those uh, at their own discretion. The committee generally finalizes their scores during their grant advisory committee meeting after they have, li after they have listened to your project presentation. When we receive a project application, it does go through a couple of different reviews, the first being a technical review. This is conducted by OPRD staff and does not receive any points. We, re we review in this step for eligibility and completeness. We also review for uh, performance and compliance. And so if you have any other grants with any of our recreation programs, either uh, existing or in the past, 
we check for compliance. So after we have completed the technical review steps, we pass your application on over to our um, outdoor recreation committee. This is a nine member committee that reviews your applications uh, to make sure that they are the best fit for the program. Their purpose is to review, rank, and score applications to recommend to the director and to the Oregon Parks and Recreation Commission. The, or, uh, the, out, the Oregon Outdoor Recreation Committee members, um, they represent various interests as established by Oregon Administrative Rule Chapter 736. In these next slides, we will cover the specific scoring criteria um, and what you'll see as you're filling out your application. So you'll need to identify uh, upfront if your project is in a close to home area or if it's in a dispersed area. And there are definitions for what that means, both in the SCORP and in the application, as well as in the manual. Priorities for SCORP criteria are identified for both close to home and dispersed area projects. Applicants with projects located within community boundaries are instructed to use close to home priorities and applicants with projects located outside of these boundaries should use dispersed setting priorities. There are some circumstances where recreation providers may choose to locate recreation facilities outside of community boundaries, which are specifically intended to serve close to home needs of the nearby community, such as regional parks, trails, or water access sites. In, su in such cases, OPRD will consider the use of close to home priorities by project applicants. The applicants must, must make the case for why the project is intended for primary use by the population within the nearby community. Such projects must be within a reasonably short distance of the community being served. After you have selected which area applies to your project, you will then select all of, your pro all of that that your project will address. So the SCORP uh, does distinguish the different priorities by, again, close to home or dispersed area. And so you'll go through your application and select those that apply either in this column only or in this column only, depending on the location of your project. The application will also ask for your consistency with statewide issues. So it will ask if your project will meet the outdoor recreation needs of an aging population, of an increasingly diverse population, families with children and low income population. Um, and again, it does provide different tables and uh, identified needs for each of these categories. And you'll see here, it also breaks it down by county. Uh, you'll need to identify how the proposed project will satisfy the needs through at least one of the four methods shown here. So these are the four different methods. Um, so if, you, if your project satisfies the needs through more than one, feel free to expand on that in your narrative. Um, but if it only will satisfy the needs through one of these, that is um, perfectly acceptable. Um, so again, if your project has gone through multiple channels to find out <clears throat> the community needs, that's great. And again, you can expand on that in your narrative. Um, so the goal of this section is that we want to see that the public was involved in the project selection and is not just the idea of, say, someone sitting behind a desk without ever having um, been vetted by the community who will eventually use what is being proposed. The SCORP and the application also give you the option to use the Parkland mapping website to conduct a half mile service area analysis in addition to these four categories. Um, and if you're not familiar with what the Parkland mapping tool is, 
There is a link to that on the LWCF website, and there will also be a link to that in your application material. If you do choose to use this Parkland mapping tool, um, these next couple of slides will show you how, how to do so. So in this example, we can see this is the UGB boundary for the Salem-Kaiser area. We've selected here um, in the checkbox a half mile to the nearest park. And so it provided us a layer of green. The green layer indicates any residents within a half mile of a park. And now we've selected the checkbox to find the half mile to the nearest park um, that, that is attached to a school. So we can see there's now a yellow layer that's been added to our mapping tool. Any areas that remain unshaded may indicate a community that is in need of a parkland. So in this gray area, they are not either, they are not half a mile uh, within either a park or a school park. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you do choose to use the tool and have questions, feel free to contact me and I can help you walk through it. The Parkland mapping tool was a joint effort by OPRD and the Population Research, Research Center at Portland State University as part of the 2019 to 2023 SCORP. Some of the information may be outdated. I believe the information was collected around 2017 or 18. Um, so some providers may find if you do choose to use the Parkland mapping tool that your information may be missing or may be outdated. Okay, so moving on here, um, this, the application will also ask about Physical activity benefits, again, this is part of the SCORP criteria. Um, you'll need to indicate if your project is located within a body weight index high priority area. And in your application, I'll reference exactly where to find that information in the SCORP. And you will also need to indicate if your project will satisfy one or more of the statewide physical activity priorities identified in the table that I will point out to you. Oregon recreation providers were asked through a 2018 survey to identify the degree to which funding issues were challenges or concerns for their agency. Funding for facility rehabilitation or replacement was the top issue identified within both UGB and dispersed areas. The scoring criteria is meant to prioritize major rehabilitation over other project types, for example, acquisition projects. Major rehabilitation projects involve, again, the restoration or partial reconstruction of eligible recreation areas and facilities necessitated by one or more of the selections shown here on the screen and are not attributed to a lack of maintenance. Please make sure to upload photos in the attachments showing the facilities in need of rehabilitation. If only part of the project is a rehab, um, tell us the approximate percentage of the project that does involve the rehabilitation. Accessibility accommodations. The application allows you to select what, if any, accessibility needs your project will satisfy and it will make reference to the specific table in the SCORP. The second part, you will have to describe what identified accessibility needs, if any, your project will satisfy for certain demographic groups. And for the universal design concepts section, we are looking for accommodation actions that go above and beyond the scope of the ADA requirements. Uh, in this section, um, so for DEI, we want to see that your organization has thought about this in some capacity, whether it be a board or council approved inclusion strategy, or that you're working towards developing strategies. This is more than just saying we are an equal opportunity employer, but rather what is your organization doing to address the inequities in the community that you serve? And if this project, you know, how it fits into those. 
in the sustainability section, we want to understand how or if sustainability was considered in the intent, strategies, and long-term plans for the project. We do request letters of support, and we think it's best if you stick within um, three to five original letters from volunteer organizations, neighborhood associations, community members, users that strongly support your project. We do recommend that you stay away from form letters. Um, in the financial section, this is uh, where you can explain your plan B or your contingency plan if your source of match doesn't come through. For instance, if you're waiting on another grant that may not, um, that may not be awarded. Okay. And lastly, um, there is an attachment section in your application and all of the attachments do have a requirement to have something uploaded. And so if there is an attachment, say for instance, there's a, a photo section. If there are no photos that you need to provide or that you wish to provide, um, the application will not let you move forward unless it's, something's been uploaded there. So in that case, you can just upload um, a Word document that says, you know, no, no attachment, just so that the system will let you push through. And then we do ask that you keep any form that we've provided in its original format. So for instance, the A and R form that I talked about earlier, please submit that as a Word document. And there's also SHPO submittal forms. We ask that you submit those to us. There's one that's a fillable PDF and there's another that's a Word document. Keep those in those formats um, because oftentimes we do have to edit the forms and it's not possible if they have been submitted as a scanned PDF. Okay, so we're getting towards the tail end of the presentation. These are resources, tips, and common mistakes that we see. Um, resources. So this is a look at what our LWCF website looks like uh, on the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department um, website. So the 2023 schedule has been updated. It will be updated once more once we have the dates for the future committee meeting um, when they will be meeting in spring of 2024. There's a couple of other forms and materials that are currently being um, edited and will be updated by September 1st for the new grant cycle. So that includes the um, state manual, which is located here in this section. And then in the application and forms, you're going to find if you visit that today, that there are uh, pre-application worksheets. So those are still the application worksheets from last year. The application really won't be much different this year. So if you wanted to kind of take a peek at what the questions are, um, but the actual worksheets will be updated with the 2023 stamp in the coming week or so. Okay, and then just a couple of other tips on the pre-application worksheets is that our sometimes our online grant system does experience technical issues. So we do highly recommend that you start with the pre-application worksheet. Um, it's a good way to have your answers saved, not on our online form. And when you're ready, you just copy paste. So that's in the event that something goes haywire with the online form, you don't need to restart you know, your typing, you have it saved somewhere else. Okay. Um, the other thing, actually, I'll back up here. So on our um, on our website, there's a link here to the right under the resources section. It's called the interactive map of Oregon LWCF sites. So if you click on that, that's available um, to anyone in the public. It takes you to our GIS website, which has all of the LWCF boundaries mapped in Oregon. And I actually have an example here. So, so I'm on the website and if you click over here, it will take you to, um, to the map of Oregon that shows 
all of the LWCF sites. So all of these orange polygons indicate there's a land and water boundary there. Um, you can also click on a particular park and gather just a little bit of information about what that exactly was. So you can see in this example, there were two LWCF grants received. If you click on that, you can see it was an improvement grant. So it's probably a development or rehabilitation, which was awarded in the 80s to the city of Woodburn. Um, if you try and click this, this actually won't work for the public. Um, this is a link to our internal database. But um, so if you have specific questions, you can contact me or log into your OPRDgrants.org account and you should have uh, copies of the grant agreements, maps, lots of other great information. So. Okay, and within your application, um, once that goes live, there is a section called files it'll have this basically the same forms that will be available on our LWCF website, um, but it's just a nice way to have it already within your application. Um, so it will have uh, links to our manual, both the state and federal. It'll have the pre-application worksheet that I talked about, um, and then a couple of other forms that will be required as attachments in your application. Application tips, get started early. Uh, again, we always recommend you start with the pre-application worksheet. Um, we recommend that you keep a backup copy of your responses, that you certainly read and follow the instructions, that you use the state grant program manual. There's online application instructions. You can download a copy of today's presentation slides. Um, you can revisit this recording. So there's a lot of information there. Um, it's there for a reason. It's important. If you have specific questions, do get a hold of me. And then as you're filling out your grant application online, recommend that you use Chrome or Firefox as the um, system will not, it's not compatible with Internet Explorer if you still have that. Okay, please be concise with your responses in the application. Staff and committee members only have a limited time to spend reading your materials. So start by answering the questions right away. Don't get too much into the history or the background of the project or you know the agency that you're submitting for. Make every word convey an important point to the grant reviewer. If it's not relevant, just leave it out. Stay away from including voluminous, voluminous attachments. So, you know, if you have a, say, master plan, please only submit the relevant pages for this project and not the whole, you know, 100-page attachment. And then um, we do ask for your patience. So we're working with federal governments and we're running on their schedule. With the land and water program, some things tend to take a lot longer as compared with our other uh, grant programs here at OPRD, especially around the federal compliance processes, such as NEPA and Section 106. Um, these are just a couple of ideas of what we think makes a good project. Um, project readiness includes having all the necessary, necessary federal permits um, in hand by the time we can apply to NPS. They won't allow us to submit a final application if there are any federal outstanding permits that you're waiting on. And then just a couple of other ideas of what makes a good project. So, um, you know, you've teamed up and you have funds from different community members, different organizations that really support your project. Uh, Match is available and secured. Your project has the multi-use potential, so you know it's um, it's inclusive, it's accessible, it's a design universally, and then clear and acceptable clear and acceptable LWCF boundary map. Um, that's where we run into sometimes a lot of questions from the National Park Service, especially if your project uh, area has received land and water assistance in years past. And if this boundary map that you're proposing is smaller 
than what was encumbered before, questions will um, definitely be asked of you. So, okay, um, common pitfalls. So compliance issues with previous LWCF projects. So if you have uh, a conversion that, you know, is not moving, it's not progressing, that may, that may not do Bodhi well. Um, if your project does not have public access, if maps are um, confusing or inaccurate. So all of these things can, can delay your project application or cause it to not move forward. Um, providing inaccurate or unrealistic budgets, not requesting enough funding. So you, you know, when we're at the end of the project, if you are awarded, you're not able to complete it because you don't have sufficient funding. Um, you're proposing an eligible match, timing, and then communication. Communication is key. Okay, next steps. So uh, what to expect if your project is recommended for funding. If you are recommended, uh, pre-award inspections are a requirement of the National Park Service when we're submitting applications. Uh, and in the last couple of cycles, I've actually gone out there to conduct the pre-award inspection before we even know if your project is recommended for funding just because the timeline is really tight after after it does get recommended so we want to um, address that early on um, that also gives us the opportunity to talk with you about any potential um, additions to your project that perhaps had not been thought about so for instance um, accessibility so sometimes when we do pre-award inspections, we can recommend things to improve accessibility in your project. And you can, um, if you have sufficient match, consider adding that to your project. And we of course can match it with uh, federal funds. Um, so finalizing all required documents, the A and R form that you'll be submitting with your application is a, is a pretty rough draft. It's likely going to require um, some editing due to you know, review from OPRD staff or by the National Park Service. And um, we're, we'll go over timing. So timing really just depends on um, various factors. One of the biggest ones being the federal compliance process. So if there is you know, a cultural resources survey that needs to be done, that may delay the time of when you may receive your award, um, just because we need to know if there's any you know, resources that may be impacted, and if so, mitigation steps. So that can take a little bit of time. Okay, and if you are successful in receiving an award, then you can expect to submit regular progress reports and requests for reimbursements. As for record time, as for record keeping, you'll need to track all project expenses and we recommend assigning a project, a code in your financial system. Uh, we'll need you to track staff time that's being used as match, volunteer time sheets, donated materials or supplies, and donated e This is a reimbursement grant, which means the grantee will initially pay project expenses and then submit your full accounting of project expenses and payments and request reimbursement for the grant's percentage of the project. The state will approve and submit to the National Park Service for reimbursement. And just to note that OPRD does hold 25% of the grant amount as retainage until completion of the project has been verified. a couple of other post-award responsibilities. So once we've closed out the project, um, you'll need to always make sure that the LWCF boundary is intact and is being used for uh, public outdoor recreation purposes. The area needs to be maintained and attractive. It needs to be kept safe. Um, you'll need to keep up with your reasonable repairs to um, make sure that your facilities are living up to their full lifetime, and the facility will need to be kept open for public use at reasonable hours and times of the year. 
Um, you'll also need to sign the area. So we'll provide to you a land and water uh, conservation fund sign that will need to be placed in a um, predominant section of the park or recreation area. Okay, and just a couple of helpful links for you. There's my contact information once again at the bottom. Um, this link will take you to our OPRD website. This link here will take you to the National Park Service website specific, specific to LWCF. Um, this is the link where you'll sign on to apply to the program. If you don't have an account, there's a link on the, on the homepage of this link um, where you can request account access. And questions. So feel free to type it in, or I, I'm not sure if you can um, raise your hand and unmute yourself in, in the Zoom uh, platform, but definitely refer to the Q&A if you have questions. Thanks, Naomi. Um, I'm gonna go ahead actually, and I think I can just turn on chat just in case anybody's having trouble either raising their hand or with Q&A. Um, so in the chat, you you might be able to chat us now if you're having trouble with those other things. Uh, but there's no open questions in the Q&A. Um, I do want to just revisit a couple of the questions just with you, Naomi. Um, someone did ask if NPS can make or we can make exception to the 50% uh, match requirement if they're a very small community. And I believe the answer is no. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. Okay. 50%. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so I did share that, you know, you could consider matching with our other grant programs that we have, like local government, um, or if it's a trail project, the rec trails program could also be an option, um, or other grants, you know, people use tourism grants and other sources to match LWCF. Um, and then um, also encouraging folks just to talk to Naomi if you're concerned about match, just we, you know, we're happy to always talk with you for any of our grant programs and make sure you're capturing everything possible that can be counted as match or, you know, make sure any creative ideas are addressed. Um, and then if you decide that 50% is just too much or not doable, you could look at our local government grant program um, because they do have lower match requirements um, for small communities in that program. That's a really good point. Thank you, Jody. Yes, um, oftentimes we have met with applicants or sponsors to figure out how we can um, match L the local government grant program with land and water. Um, that's pretty common. Or we've also used RTP to match with LWCF. So it's just kind of a matter of aligning our timelines. And um, mm -hmm. usually our the, the LGG program especially can be a little bit more flexible just because it's not federally funded, but definitely reach out if that's something you might be interested in. Yeah. And if you, if it is a trail project and you're using both RTP and LWCF, just pack your patience because um, mm -hmm. we have two federal agencies involved. And so it can sometimes be a slog. Sometimes things align perfectly, um, but that's something where many only and I would coordinate closely. Um, and there's another question um, from somebody saying that they looked at the completed projects um, and didn't see much, if anything, as far as land acquisitions. Um, and they're just asking if that is rare in the program. I know we've done a lot historically, but um, any recent examples, Naomi? I think our most recent example of a land acquisition project is from our 2020 grant cycle. Um, that was a grant awarded to the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District for a brand new park area. Um, so we don't see them too often. They are eligible. Um, so if that's something you're thinking of, reach out or um, yeah, contact me if you have questions. So it is eligible. We just don't mm -hmm. see a lot of them. Yeah, and our local government grant program also can fund acquisition. And so we've had a few others um, in recent years that local government grant program has supported. Um, and there could be reasons why they went to that program instead of LWCF, maybe because of match, or maybe if they didn't have a yellow book appraisal, um, local government has a little more flexibility with their appraisal requirements. Um, but Willowa County had a big land acquisition as well as Klamath County in, in recent years. So we, we do them, but yeah, not as common. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another question that somebody already asked and I already answered just about nonprofit eligibility. And I did say that no, nonprofits aren't eligible for LWCF, um, but you could apply depending on the project for our um, rec trails or ATV programs or both trail specific. Uh, but just also want to just put a plug that we have seen ways that nonprofits or volunteers in the community have supported 
the applicant and their LWCF application, whether the agency wants to delegate some questions to that group or volunteer to help answer or do some of the legwork with you know, filling out forms and submitting them to their partners or gathering letters of support. Um, in some cases, we've even had um, government jurisdictions give access in the grant site to a volunteer to help them on the application. We, you know, they get a lot of access, so we always work with you to make sure that that's really appropriate. But um, even if you're not eligible as a nonprofit, there may be ways that you can support the community in their in their application. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions. Um, I will I will go back just a little bit to the federal processes. So in recent years, we've seen a lot more requests, be it from the State Historic Preservation Office or from tribes. Um, just a request for surveys in the project area. And so typically we have waited to submit your um, consultation to the State Historic Preservation Office until after we know if your project has been recommended for funding. Um, but just to kind of get ahead of, you know, of that and knowing if there will be a survey required in your area. Um, this year, we're probably going to be submitting the consultation on your behalf a little earlier before we know if your project is recommended, just so that if, if it does get recommended, um, you're aware and we can start working on that timeline to hopefully get your project awarded a little bit sooner than if we would have done it after, after your project gets recommended. Okay, so there's a question in the Q&A. Could you discuss in greater detail the context of properties involving easements? You mentioned it, but I'm not totally clear on what is eligible. Um, let's see here. So, a, so are you at Philip? Are you asking about um, if you're submitting a brand new application for uh, that involves an easement, or are you talking about easements that are already within a land and water boundary and you're maybe adding one after the boundary has been intact. And Philip, I can just go ahead and take you off um, mute. So if you want to share verbally, you could do that too. Oh, okay. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. you have the floor. Yeah. No, so I've got a, a, a potential project where there's an existing easement um, for an irrigation ditch and there's some interest in turning that irrigation ditch into a, a like a trail. Oh, okay. Um, that's something we can talk about if, uh, let's see here. We don't see a lot of those, but they are eligible. So it would need to be a permanent easement and it would need to be dedicated to an eligible um, project sponsor. So like say the city or the county or, um, yeah, so it, it could be something that we could fund. Okay. Thank you. Great. If anybody else has questions, you can use the chat, the Q&A, or raise your hand. I don't see anything else. Um, and I did drop Naomi's email in the chat along with the links a few times to our website, so you can always follow up with her after. Thank you, Jody. Okay, I think uh, we'll wrap this up. So um, again, this presentation will be made available, both the recording and the slides. The recording will have chapters. It'll be on YouTube and I'll um, send the link afterwards, but it'll have chapters. So if you're interested only in a specific section, it'll be easy for you to find that particular part in the PowerPoint. Thank you all so much for your time this morning. Have a great day.